United States Secretary of State John Kerry has used a speech at the end of his five-day visit to Myanmar, Australia and Solomon Islands to set a new broader agenda for US relations with the Asia-Pacific region. Speaking at the East West Centre in Hawaii, Mr Kerry called for an improvement of relations with China and emphasised the importance of regional cooperation on everything from economic issues to climate change and human rights. President Obama has made it clear that the United States welcomes the rise of a peaceful, prosperous and stable China, one that plays a responsible role in Asia and the world and supports rules and norms on economic and security issues. The President has been clear, as have I, that we are committed to avoiding the trap of strategic rivalry and intend on, on, on forging a relationship in which we can broaden our cooperation on common interests and constructively manage our differences and disagreements. John Kerry there and Gordon Flake is on the board of the United States Committee of the Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific and heads up the US Asia Centre in Perth. Mr Flake, thank you for joining us. My pleasure, happy to be here. Firstly, Secretary of State John Kerry has been told by President Barack Obama to redouble efforts in the Asia Pacific. We're roughly midway through his second and final term. Is it too little too late? I'm not sure there's been much of a change from the first term of the Obama administration. You know, from the very beginning, the president himself at the top level began to focus on what people have called the pivot towards Asia or rebalancing towards Asia. And so this isn't really so much about Secretary Kerry's tenure as it is President Obama's tenure. And I think probably for the most part, despite ups and downs of how it's articulated, you know, the rebalancing towards Asia and its three dimensions, military, diplomatic and economic, uh, continues to pace. Yes, you mentioned the pivot to Asia, a term coined by John Kerry's predecessor Hillary Clinton. Now some analysts say China got the jump on the US when President Obama missed some key summits including ASEAN, East Asia and APEC. That doesn't really reflect well on the US's efforts to uh, re-engage the region, does it? Again, there's a lot of ways you can describe this, you know, pivoting, rebalancing, redoubling. But in the end, uh, from the very start of the Obama mission, the question is, where do we put our, our longest term and most sincere priority? And that's the Asia Pacific. Now, of course, if there's a distraction right now, it's that the events in the old world, if you will, in the Middle East, in Europe, continue to pull the United States back into those issues and eat up a lot of airtime. But the fact that we had here in Australia just this week in Osman ministerial meeting where despite everything else going on in the world you had the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State here both of who came from other venues in Asia seems to imply to me that rather being in the Middle East or Ukraine or even Washington DC that they were here in Australia uh, a degree of importance and priority placed on the Asia Pacific. When the US began to highlight the Asia-Pacific relationship, some analysts suggested that it was a response to a rising China and even an attempt to contain its influence in the region. Is there any truth to that at all? Yeah, there's a half-truth there. There's no question that the US pivot towards Asia is partially reactive. Uh, the part that's not true is that it's some effort to contain China or to push back against China. The reality is that at the very beginning of the Obama administration, the president came in as self-declared our first Asia-Pacific president, having been raised part of his childhood in Indonesia you know, and in Hawaii, where he had a very different perspective on the Asia-Pacific. And like probably the broader consensus in the U.S., recognized that the future of the United States lie in the Asia-Pacific. So that, that underlying sentiment was already there. What changed things is that when the, the Secretary of State at that time, Hillary Clinton, toured the region, on every stop there was rising concern about Chinese aggressive and proactive actions in the region and so I think almost every country and every ally in the region was telling the United States that they wanted the United States back in a more proactive role focused on more than just terrorism which was the case during the the Bush administration in a pointed request of China, Washington has again proposed a freeze on provocative acts in the South China Sea, even though there seems to have been a de-escalation there. Is this simply poking the hornet's nest, exactly what China doesn't want to see? 
I don't think it's poking the hornet's nest. I think it's reiterating the same statements that I think have, have helped contribute to some reduction in tensions. Uh, Secretary Kerry just today, just a few hours ago in, in Honolulu, you know, gave a speech where he really, once again, as he did in ASEAN and here in Australia, emphasized that while the United States does not take a position on sovereignty issues, they certainly do take a position on process. And process that involves coercion, involves violence, involves the use of force, uh, you know, is certainly not something the United States is going to support, particularly when that involves treaty allies such as the Philippines, you know, or Australia, or in the case of the South China Seas, you know, increasingly important partners like Vietnam. Given the global events that are currently demanding the attention of the US, is it inevitable that the Asia-Pacific region take a bit of a back seat for the moment? You're exactly correct. Events in Ukraine, events in Syria, events in Iraq, events in, in Israel and Gaza are all things which, again, take away from the most precious real estate in town, and that is the attention and the time of the principles. So I would be ridiculous to assume or to assert that those aren't important factors and factors that make it more difficult to pay attention to Asia to the degree that we may want to otherwise. But that said, uh, that hasn't led to any you know, fundamental deterioration of time, attention or policy uh, in regards to the rebalancing towards Asia. Okay, Gordon Flake, we'll have to leave it there, but thank you again for your insights. My great pleasure. Thank you.